I thought you saw it on. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this Sunday talk. It's coming to you from Amaravati Monastery on a very bright and sunny afternoon. Uh, my name is Ajahn Damanando, and I'm going to be talking on the subject of the ongoing Dhamma of climate change. So <clears throat> I'd like to start by, uh, with a small disclaimer. Uh, by, uh, I don't by any means consider myself to be an expert on climate change, uh, nor even do, do I consider myself to be an expert on Buddha Dhamma. However, I am a Theravadan monk. Um, I'm a practicing monk in this tradition. I do care about the issue. Um, I think that this is, you know, a huge issue for humanity. And at its bottom, it is a spiritual issue. And because of that, and because I'm in spiritual training of uh, one sort, I feel it's also incumbent on, on people in our position to offer some kind of view, some kind of uh, take on, on, the, on the problem of climate change. So that's why I'm offering the talk. So um, the, the, the topic is the Dhamma of climate change. And Dhamma has several meanings, or sometimes multiple meanings in the Pali texts, or as the Buddha used the word. But there are two particular meanings I'd like to bring out, maybe a third one to mention. So the first meaning, Dhamma, with a small d, is something which exists. It's a reality, if you like. So we are confronted with this, quotation marks, reality of climate change. Now, we know that for several decades, people, many people, and also particularly institutions, were in denial that this was actually happening. And in fact, certain media outlets were very intent on trying to destroy uh, the, the perception that the climate change was even happening, or that it was man-made. But I think, even though there may be climate change deniers still in the world, that overall we must be beginning to realize that it is a reality because of the events that we see going on around us in every continent. So let's say that that is an understood between us, that this is the reality, the Dhamma of climate change. Now the second meaning of Dhamma I'd like to bring out is that of teaching. So Buddha Dhamma is a teaching of the Buddha, and any kind of Dhamma is a teaching. Uh, so I believe, I do believe that climate change has the capacity to teach us something. It can seem at times overwhelming and terrifying and completely sort of beyond our ability to do anything about. But we say, for example, in this monastery, that when you meet the most difficult person on your daily round or in the community, that person can be your greatest teacher. And so too, I think, some of the greatest challenges we face can also be our great teachers. And the final meaning is that of nature. So Dhamma and nature are often considered to be similar or the same thing. And yes, we have nature involved in climate change. So this is one of the topics, obviously, one has to consider in this talk. So before I come on to the of what's happening in the world in terms of climate change, I'd just like to mention my own sort of small epiphany, something which occurred to me um, many years ago. It's just a small experience, but I'll mention it. So this was 1978. Uh, at that time, I was not a monk. I was uh, somebody training to be a, a teacher, and I was doing a teaching practice in Madrid, in Spain. And there were many other students doing the same thing in schools or colleges in, in the city. And we used to get together and go out at the weekends to the surrounding towns around Madrid, uh, usually by bus, come back by bus, and have an, uh, spend a day out from the city. So anyway, this particular evening, I was coming back towards Madrid from a, one of these surrounding towns. I was in a bus, and we were slowly edging our way forward. There was a huge tailback hundreds of emissions going into the air from the cars and buses and lorries and so on. And as I sat there in the bus, I began to think about all the other places I'd done the same thing. I remember in London, often being driven by my father in London, sitting through immense tailbacks with all the emissions going on. 
I've often been, well, sometimes been to Paris with a family I knew in France, and with similar story, huge tailbacks. And then finally, I was living for a short while in Thailand for about 20 months. I lived near Bangkok, and of course, the Bangkok traffic jams are celebrated around the world. <laughs> Even then, which was many years ago, they were quite severe, probably not as bad as they are now. But again, huge amounts of emissions emerging into the air as we sat and crawled our way forward. So I began to think, as I sat there in the bus, this is happening in every city. It's happening in every town all around the globe. And if this is happening like this, how can it not affect the atmosphere? How can it not affect the planet? So that a moment, my mind kind of flipped over and I sort of became converted to the idea there must be some really serious effects uh, coming from all of these emissions. I probably didn't yet understand about climate change, but that was certainly planted in my heart at that particular moment. Now, what about climate change? So I, I'm going to try and say my very best, uh, give you a good summary about it. I'm not an expert, as I said, but uh, for some of you, you will be very educated in what climate change is all about. And this will be a little bit tedious, some of the facts I'm going to recite to you. But there may be other people who are uh, listening in who have not had, who are not so familiar with these, what we consider to be facts. Okay, so first of all, the Earth and its atmosphere is warming up. Um, we know this because the polar ice caps are melting. So both the Arctic and the Antarctic are gradually melting. Uh, huge lumps of ice shelf are breaking off and becoming small glaciers. And in the Himalayas, there is uh, glacier melt. And we believe that the reason for this is that uh, human beings have been burning fossil fuels, that's coal, gas, and oil, in excessive amounts for the last 150, maybe 200 years. And gradually, these CO2, these carbon dioxide, um, particles have accumulated in the atmosphere. So they say that in pre-industrial times, there were 262 parts of carbon in the atmosphere per million parts. And now it's something like 400 parts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere per million. So it's a, it's a big increase. And these, this, uh, this carbon dioxide is forming a kind of envelope around the Earth. Now, in, norm, in previous times, the sun, obviously the earth warms up when the sun uh, shines on it, uh, but it could always uh, cool down again because the, the heat could escape through the atmosphere. But now, with this envelope of carbon dioxide, the, a lot of heat gets reflected back. So it's trying to escape from the earth's surface, but it gets reflected back. And so this contributes to a slowly um, increasing level of temperature on the earth's surface. So I talked a little bit about the North and South Poles and the Himalayan glaciers. Uh, of course, the glacier melt means that the populations of uh, China and India are in danger possibly of losing their freshwater supplies because they, they rely on those glaciers. But there are many other effects. So with the melt, obviously the sea levels are being affected and there's a gradually, gradually rising level of, of sea. Um, now, this could overwhelm island nations in the Pacific and perhaps the Indian Ocean, but also could affect sea, uh, coastal low-lying areas such as, or cities such as London, Shanghai, Bangkok, and perhaps entire countries like Bangladesh could in the end be flooded. So <clears throat> people are extremely concerned about this. Naturally, we would have, if, we, if that happened, we'd have hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of people on the move migrating from these areas. So it's not just the rising sea levels, it's also the effect on the ocean. Apparently, something like 90% of the heat that's been uh, created so far uh, is going into the ocean. And with the CO2 as well, the ocean is being acidified. And so this acidified ocean is affecting marine life. So particularly uh, plankton, mollusks, uh, small creatures at the bottom of the food chain are being affected. And in fact, we are told that something like 50% uh, of the world's coral reefs 
have already disappeared in the last 30 years. So that's a lot, isn't it? 50% of the world's coral reefs. Uh, why coral reef is important is because something like one third of marine life lives on coral reefs. One, sorry, one, you know, no, one quarter of marine life lives on coral reefs. And the prediction is that as if we carry on as we're going, so something like 90% of coral reef will have disappeared in another 30 years. So this is a big issue for fishing. And in fact, since 1997, global fish catches have been in decline. So we're already beginning to feel the effects of, of the acidification of the ocean. So there's the melt, the rise in sea levels, the acidification of the ocean. Then we go on to uh, extreme weather events. These are the most visible and sh uh, shocking to us because we see human beings being affected. So <clears throat> in the last week, I think in the eastern United States, there was an incredibly heavy rainfall, a huge downpour, and uh, New York and New Jersey were very much affected. 45 people, I think, were killed. Only earlier in the week, I think there was very heavy storms and rain in Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, earlier on, we saw uh, flooding in West Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands and Switzerland. Some quite shocking scenes coming from there. And also, there was in, uh, some very major flooding in China, in I think Hunan province, and there was a city called Zhangjiao, where hundreds of thousands of people had to be evacuated. And something like uh, one year's level, one year's amount of rainfall fell in three days. So these are kind of very shocking statistics. At the other end of the, uh, <coughs> of the spectrum, we have the prospect of wildfires. So we're used to wildfires in Australia and, Ca and California, but they're now appearing in um, parts of the North and Pacific coast in Canada, which is quite sh shocking, and also in places like Siberia, as well as, of course, in the Mediterranean. So we've had wildfires in Turkey and Greece, and also still in the Iberian Peninsula. These things are still happening. So these are all visible um, indicators of climate change. And obviously, it's something we need to pay close attention to. <clears throat> or that grabs our attention. Now, some people might say, well, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to change to uh, sustainable and renewable sources of energy. We're going to change over to electric cars. Uh, we'll make various technological changes and life will carry on as normal. There'll be no problem or not so much of a problem. However, this is unlikely to be the case, unfortunately, because the climate change that we see is only the pinnacle or the tip of an iceberg. And then down below the level of the water, there is an even bigger iceberg. So I just want to sort of mention this without overdoing it, not being a complete doom merchant, but I, I need this uh, sheet because I'm, I'm not very good at um, remembering statistics. So just to say, for instance, that in terms of the temperature, Currently, we're supposed to be 1.3% hotter than uh, in pre-industrial times. And in the Paris, recent Paris meeting in 2015, they were trying to peg uh, the temperature rise to 2% or less, uh, if possible 1.5%, because the Pacific nations, these small islands like Tuvalu and so on, were begging the bigger nations, please, if you get to 2%, we will be inundated. So the aim is 2%, but uh, it may head higher than that. So what is this uh, lower part of the iceberg that I just mentioned? First of all, let's talk about human population. So these statistics can be a bit shocking. I'm, I, I apologize if it, if it comes across as uh, unpleasant for you. But in the Buddha's time, there were 100 million human beings on the earth, we're told. Obviously, these are estimates. 100 million human beings, that's quite a lot. If I was to say to you, uh, there, there are 100 million killer sharks in the, uh, in the world, or 100 million vampire bats, or 100 million saber-toothed tigers, you might be quite shocked. No, but 100 million human beings 
at the time of the Buddha. So fast forward to 1947, which was just after the Second World War, and the level of human population now stood at 2.5 billion. So a billion is a million millions, that's 2.5 million millions uh, in 1947. And then move slightly forward again to 2018, that's three years ago, and the level of the population stood at 7.7 .7 billion, 7.7 .7 million millions. If we continue to increase, then the projection is that by 2100 there will be 11 billion, 11 million millions of humans on the planet's surface. So you can see that this has been an astronomical or exponential growth. On top of that, uh, maybe in the 1800s, something like just over 3% of people lived in cities, and the rest, everybody else lived in the rural areas. They lived, uh, you know, farming or working with forestry or fishery or whatever. But now, something like over 50% of the human beings in the, around the, the world live in cities or, or in urban areas. So that is a major change. And this helps to explain many other changes which I'm going to mention. So before I go on to that, I'd like to mention a small interview I, I saw, I came across by chance. It was with Bertrand Russell back in 1952. So it's black and white interview. Uh, Bertrand Russell is a famous, or was a famous philosopher in the UK, and he could be considered to be one of the sages or seers of the modern era in some ways. So he was being interviewed because it was his 80th birthday, and the interviewer was saying to him, Lord Russell, what, what would you like to see happen in terms of human, you know, human development? And he came up with three proposals, which no doubt would have sounded quite absurd at the time to most people. So the first was world government. He said we should strive for world government because with all the weapons that we've created, nations can do extreme harm to each other. So the world government should hold onto the, onto the weapons and national governments should run their economies and so forth. So he was saying world government, which um, even now seems a little far-fetched. His second proposition was that the standard of living between the rich countries and the poor countries should be equalized. So the rich countries should help the poor countries to raise their standard of living to the same level. Now, even in 52, that would have sounded extraordinary. What do you mean? How can you do that? But nowadays, we see massive migrations of people from the poor countries to the rich ones. So maybe Lord Russell had a point there. And the third proposition was that um, human population, the human population st should be stabilized roughly the same level. So at that stage, you know, roughly 2.5 billion. So I, I thought I was really struck by the farsightedness of this particular uh, man. I thought I'd mention it. So anyway, what's happening? So in agriculture, over the last 30 years, unfortunately, we've lost one third of the arable land of the earth. And the reason for this is the soil has degraded and also because of erosion. So why are these things happening? It's because of the way we've treated the soil. The Food Agricultural Organization reckons we need about 15 million new acres per year to sustain the world's population, but in fact we're losing more than that every year. Deforestation, we've lost half of temperate and tropical forests, and there is a deforestation is going on. Often, sometimes it's connected with farming, with, uh, for example, rearing cattle. It's very profitable to rear cattle and then export meat to the rich markets of the world. But the forests help to guarantee the climate and hold the soil together. So this is, uh, has extreme knock-on effects on the soil and on climate. So many chemicals have been created over the last hundred years, thousands of them, often not properly tested for the long-term effects. 
And they've gone into the soil, they've gone into the rivers, into the lakes, and into the seas. And they've had a widespread effect. For example, there's something called persistent organic pollutants, which get into the bodies of the human beings, as well as uh, marine animals. They're called POPs. POPs cause development defects, chronic illnesses, and some are carcinogenic. But these are going into our bodies. There's something called hypertrophication. That's where fertilizers and detergents run into the lakes and the rivers and then into the sea. And they create dead zones of water where nothing can grow because these, uh, what they're called, um, algal blooms kill anything alive. So toxic to humans, toxic to animals and fish, toxic to other plants. So that's why these dead zones of water appear in the sea. Because of the numbers of people, I guess, and because of the level of agriculture, the fresh water is being depleted in certain areas of the world. So it's very clear in the Middle East, in some parts of Africa, in California now, they're facing a major water shortage, and of course, traditionally in Australia. So this is because of falling water tables and the overpumping of aquifers. We keep using water, obviously. And when we drench the soils in poisons, this has immense effect on the life of, for example, insects. So in Germany, in the last 27 years, they were counting the number of flying insects, and over 27 years, they reduced by uh, 76%. And when you, when you slaughter insects, of course, that has an effect on the birds' population, and bird populations have been falling. And now one in eight birds is an endangered species. So we're looking at what they call the sixth mass extinction. There have been extinctions before in Earth's history. And something like, uh, we've reduced the population of wildlife by 67%. Um, between 1970 and 212, uh, wild vertebrates, the number of wild vertebrates fell by 58%. 90% of large predator fish have gone. The endangered species are not just the birds, but also one in four mammals, one in three amphibians, 70% of the world's plant species, 75 of marine fisheries are now overfished. And then we have the issue of plastic. So um, we've been using plastic. I remember back when I was a schoolboy, seeing films in the cinema, you know, these short films they would show you before the main one, uh, just extolling this wonderful new invention, plastic, how brilliant these scientists have been to create it, how versatile it is, we could do this, we could do that. So that was in the 1960s, and now plastic is regarded as one of the curses of the modern world, um, rightly so. So um, the WFEF did a study that says by 2050, 2050, there will be more plastic in the oceans than fish. Uh, already there are 165 million tons in the ocean and every year a further 8 million metric tons of plastic get dumped into the ocean. Now as we know plastic doesn't degrade, doesn't biodegrade, but it, um, it does break down into smaller and smaller particles and these marine organisms at the bottom of the sea uh, consume these particles and so they're getting into the bottom of the food chain and ending up of course in our bodies. So there's a huge vortex of microplastic debris. First of all, in the Pacific, it's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and there apparently is a similar one in the Atlantic. So this is the kind of thing that, unfortunately, we've been doing to the planet, and why the, a few twists or technological turns and so on here and there may not be sufficient to solve the problem. So what is the roots, or what are the roots of the problem? <clears throat> well, I think it goes back deep into Western society and Western culture. Uh, certain attitudes have developed, and then we have exported those attitudes to the other cultures of the world. And the, pr the principal problem is this, that we have devalued nature. Nature has been objectified. It's just become an object, something that we use as a means to an end. So um, perhaps the problem goes back a long way. Just 
Because in Genesis 1.28, Genesis 1.28, you can read this. Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing. So this is presumably the words of God, giving dominion or domination to man. And as some writers explain, we now have this domination paradigm or mechanistic paradigm where we just dominate nature and use it uh, for our own purposes, for our own wishes. So I'd just like to go a little bit further on and say that you know, uh, in medieval times and rena early Renaissance times, people did not have this view. They had a much greater respect for nature. They were in touch with nature, they lived with nature, they relied on nature for, you know, for example, things were made of wood, um, people needed the soil, people needed the forest, people needed the river to get the water out of. They were, you know, depending on nature and in trying to be at least in harmony with nature. Um, so early Renaissance people were aware that nature was sensitive uh, and responded to uh, to human activity and could be very much affected by human activity. They had that awareness. And because of the belief systems of the day, you know, the cosmogony of the day, there was God, there was a kind of hierarchy of the church and various things, and there was man, and then he was responsible to God for his actions. There was the final judgment. And presumably that would restrain people from being too greedy or too destructive. But what began to change around the 1600s was that science was becoming more and more uh, important. Science was, was developing. And I'd just like to read you a quote from uh, somebody who wrote in 1623 on the subject of nature. So this was Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon was at one time the Lord Chancellor of England. So he's writing on the subject of nature and advising people how to relate to nature. And this is his words, to follow, and as it were, to hound nature in her wanderings, and you will be able to lead and drive her afterwards. She can be forced out of her natural state, and squeezed, and moulded, and tortured, until she takes orders from man. So that was Roger Bacon in 1623. Now, exactly 100 years later, there was a clergyman called William Derham, this is 1723, and he wrote the following words, We can, if need be, ransack the whole globe, penetrate into the bowels of the earth in order to acquire wealth. So we see between these two quotes an interesting change. So the first quote is talking about nature as animate, but to be tortured, to be driven, and to be moulded by mankind. And in the second quote, nature has now become an inanimate object to be rifled and ransacked. In the 1770s, uh, Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, and his whole thesis was that we could go out into the world and use its resources the economy would forever be expanding and improving and human life would be improving as a result. And I think we're still running on that model. We've taken these models to heart and we're still running on that model. So there is now a consensus reality that the things out there are just objects that we can use and put to use for our, for our own benefit. So for example, the corporate business world, particularly in agriculture, we, we, agriculture is now dominated by industrial agriculture. The, fir, the family farm has mainly died out and industrial agriculture sees all the facets of nature as just something to be used and manipulated to, in order to make profit. So the, the um, basic bottom line is it needs to be, there needs to be high productivity for minimum investment. And that is why, or one of the reasons why, so many chemicals have gone into the ground, fertilizers, insecticides, pesticides, and so forth, to maximize the crop. 
at minimum uh, uh, investment. And so many trees and other things have been pushed uh, one way or another or, or destroyed in order to make room for prairie farming. But as somebody said, you know, does the world belong to us? Obviously, corporate uh, investors think the world belongs to us. Or is it the other way around, that we belong to the world? Human beings are part of the biosphere. We're part of the, the web of life. In fact, without the web of life, where will we, where will we be? So gradually, the wildlife has been pushed to, to the margins. And now, um, because of our own needs, we've created one billion cattle, one billion sheep, one billion pigs, 25 billion chickens. And this livestock, they, uh, most of them are ruminants. And because uh, they're ruminants, they give off this gas, methane. So the other issue to mention is that of methane. So in, in the Siberian tundra, under the permafrost, there are huge quantities of methane stored. And as the earth begins to warm up, so the permafrost is beginning to melt and large quantities of methane are being released. And methane is coming from these livestock. And methane is 30 times as dangerous than uh, carbon dioxide in terms of being a greenhouse gas. So this could add profoundly to the levels of heat in the earth. So with this um, growing problem, uh, how are we to respond? How are we to, to react to it? Because it cannot seem very, at times, seem very hopeless. You know, um, we can you know, we can sort of feel overwhelmed and unable to cope, or totally hopeless or powerless when we confront these problems as they're described, as scientists outline them. And many of us feel very powerless. We don't have influence. We don't sit on the boardrooms of giant corporations. We don't sit, you know, in the cabinet table, around the cabinet table. Uh, we don't have a lot of wealth and so forth. But there is something I want to say about that. We don't have to feel powerless. Um, and I'd, I'd like to read a quote from a, an Irish jurist, politician, and, and uh, writer, Edmund Burke, very famous in the English-speaking world. Nobody made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. Nobody made a bigger mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. So how are we to respond to this growing crisis? Well, as I see it, um, there is a spectrum of behaviors uh, or, or a spectrum of responses. <clears throat> At one end, there is indifference, like, um, well, what's it got to do with me? And, you know, I'll be dead anyway by the time these things happen. And so what? Or resignation, it's going to happen, whatever I do. Or despair, it's just too much, I can't handle it, so what's the point of doing anything? So this is the end of the spectrum that results in paralysis or quiescence. And then if you go to the other end of the spectrum, there's frantic or manic activity. People get so kind of anxious and so worked up, they start running around doing this, that and the other, not really contemplating very deeply what they're doing or the effect that they have on other people. So it could take the form of, um, you know, maybe lashing out at people, or some kind of violence, uh, abusing people and so forth, or trying to destroy buildings or, or particular establishments or whatever. So that's the you know, far end of the spectrum, what I call frantic activity. But in Buddhism, we always look for the middle way. And I like to suggest that there will be and is a middle way in between these two extremes. And this involves mindfulness and contemplation, first of all. We have to bring mindfulness to our own jit, our own heart and mind, what's going on in here, and mindfulness and contemplation to what's going on outside. So if we look inside, if we calm the mind, and get some insight of what's happening inside of us, then we can start to examine our own intentions and our own motivations. And this is extremely important, that we come from 
somewhere that is gen uh, genuinely uh, not concerned with self, but concerned with the situation and with the fortunes of other people and other species. So that's the first thing. And on, on top of that, we need to, uh, in Buddhism, we would talk about linking up ends and means. Sometimes uh, people say it's okay to use any kind of means to get to a certain end. You know, the, the, the end will be so good, peace or whatever, we need to have a few wars along the way to achieve it or uh, do some uh, underhand things to achieve our end. But in Buddhism, Buddhism, we say the ends and the means need to match. So how we go about, if we want to take action in regard to climate change, if we want to change things for the better, how we do that matters. So finally, we need to set an example. If we are going to do something about it, if we want to do something about it, then we need to set an example, an example to other people that will inspire them rather than repel them. So this is why I think sometimes if people resort to violence or to abuse or to vilifying people, they're making a very big mistake. Because what we need more than anything is to convince the public or the wider people, wider population, that this is a good way to go if we are concerned about climate change. So what was it that the Buddha said? Some people ask, what is the Buddha or what would the Buddha have said about climate change? And to be honest, I, I really don't think he would have said anything because climate change at that stage uh, did not exist. So you had a much smaller population in the earth. They were living in a much better balance with nature. Uh, there were much smaller population in the cities. Uh, you had problems. Wherever there are human beings, there are problems, but we didn't have the problem of climate change. So <clears throat> I think what we have to do is look to the Buddha's words and his teachings and look for the underlying principles that lie beneath them. And then going from those principles, we can learn or we can take advantage of them uh, in some way. We can face properly the problems of today and particularly this problem of climate change and the other issues I've mentioned with regard to the human impact on the planet. So I'd like to start, because it's often forgotten, with the Brahma Viharas. Uh, so that's Metta, Karuna, uh, Mudita and Dupeka. If we don't cultivate these, then whatever we do, we're likely to do something unwise. So we very much need to have a sense of loving kindness, a sense of compassion, obviously, for living creatures as well as other humans, a sense of joy when people experience good fortune, and then also equanimity. Because if we are trying to do something, uh, working to sort of ameliorate the problems of climate change and the other issues, then we need to have an equanimous outlook because we may not see immediate results. If we put in effort and so forth, we may not see results. It may be very disappointing. So <clears throat> some climate change activists become very despondent or they be full of anger, full of despair and so forth. And this is where the Buddhist teachings can be of so much benefit to anyone who is involved in climate change activism, because what they need to do is get a perspective on what's going on inside of them, understanding the emotions and so forth that they're experiencing and being able to let go of these, these emotions. So the, the unique problems that we're facing in terms of this kind of triple whammy of, of uh, things that have come together the first is the very high level of human population. The second is that we now have immense technological power that we didn't have in the past. And the last one is that we have an economic system that drives forward for profit and using resources uh, at all costs. So whereas in the time of the medieval man or the Renaissance, you had this uh, cos cosmogony, this hierarchy of being with God at the top, Gradually, as the centuries went by in the West, God fell away. And without God, there were no limits to uh, what man could do in order to fulfill or gratify his desires, which is where we are at today. So we're now in, um, in the age of consumerism or mechanism or the domination paradigm.
So I'd like to read one or two quotes. This is Thich Nhat Hanh. We're here to awaken from the illusion of our separation. We're here to awaken from the illusion of our separation. So looking at what we have done in terms of um, uh, harm to the planet, I'd like to contrast that with the, the example of indigenous peoples. Yeah, the Native American Indians, the Aborigines in Australia, for them, they were very much part of the web of life. They had enormous veneration and respect for the trees, the prairies, the rivers, the mountains, and also the living creatures. Uh, even when they caught the fish, they would thank the fish for coming to feed them. And similarly, with the Aborigines, they cared deeply about the environment in which they lived, whether it's rocks or sand or pebbles or whatever, and the creatures that, that, that lived uh, in, that, uh, in that country. And no doubt when the Western people encountered these cultures, they, were, they found them ridiculous and laughable. But looking over the long term and seeing the long term effects of industrialization, one begins to see that maybe these people were right. In fact, I'd like to read one Native American Indian quote. I don't know who it was who said this. He says, when the last tree has been cut down, the last fish caught, the last river poisoned, only then will we realize that we cannot eat money. So money is now at the apex of our concerns and has been for some time. Money used to be bits of paper in the hand. It's now more often plastic in the hand or it's digits on a screen, figures, digits on a screen. Um, and for this concept of money, we are wreaking havoc on the natural world, which is our real wealth. Our real wealth is fertile land, clean rivers, uh, forests, uh, a habitat that is suitable for life. And so for one imaginary form of wealth, we are destroying our real source of wealth. So what about the underlying principles that the Buddha was uh, teaching? So I'll come, after the Brahma Viharas, I'd like to talk a little bit about Hiri and Otapa. Hiri and Otapa, moral shame and moral dread. These have an enormous role. If we, if we do care about the planet and the survival of species and our own survival, then Hiri and Otapa must be, must be we, we must use these wisdom uh, faculties uh, properly. Hiri and Otaba, shame of doing wrong, dread of doing wrong. So to come to the precepts, the five basic precepts, um, to look at them from a slightly different angle, if you like, but the first one, not harming and not killing. The Buddha made this very clear. This was his first precept. Again and again, the first of all the precepts you could take, the first one is not harming and not killing. And I'm not surprised he did. If you consider human activity, uh, we are the most ferocious predator on the, on the face of the earth. We really are the killer species. So we, we kill uh, many other kinds of life for our own benefit or because we don't happen to like it. And then when we're not killing other forms of life, we're killing each other. So there's plenty of wars and genocides and so forth. I don't know of any other species that has behaved in that way. So the Buddha set it as the first precept, not harming and not killing. And there are many, many incidences where he meets, for example, boys t t torturing fish or torturing a snake. And he says, don't do that. Don't do that. If you want to be happy, don't do that. So here are the words of the Buddha from the Dhammapada. Whoever, seeking his own happiness, harms with the rod other pleasure-loving beings, experiences no happiness hereafter. So in terms of what's happening to the planet, the earth, the climate, we need to think of all the living creatures, not just the, the creatures around us, and try to consider the welfare of all of them. 
Now the second uh, precept is about not, not stealing. So within human society, we can be you know, very honest, we can earn a, a, uh, our living, we can pay our debts, we can not steal from people uh, in terms of money, and we feel, right, I'm a good citizen and I'm following that particular uh, precept. But if we stand back, we may see that humanity as a whole is taking that which is not given day after day. So we're taking from the biosphere, we're taking from the planet, we're taking from the earth. And that is something that we should consider very carefully. So as I say, the corporate model, you can exploit the earth for maximum productivity and maximum profit. But this is a form of stealing. I like to consider the fifth precept on the intoxication. So we normally take this to mean not, drink, not consuming intoxicating drink, not taking drugs which lead to carelessness. But there are other forms of intoxication. And one form is consumerism. Never enough consumerism is a form of intoxication. Or even one might say addiction. So people who are not particularly happy, they think, well, I'll buy something else that will cheer me up, fill the void, fill the hole with a new product or a new gadget or whatever. And so we, we spend huge amounts of money, huge amounts of time consuming things that sometimes I think we really hardly need at all. But these have become one of the main uh, pastimes of human beings. Cons consumption, buying things, and storing them in their houses, not sharing them with others, but keeping them for some future time. So one of the good ideas coming out of the run-up to the COP26 conference in Glasgow, I've heard a couple of good ideas on the media. One is that we should form sharing circles. So people in a certain locality, instead of having power tools and other things that they use once in a long while, could get into a kind of sharing circle where they don't have to buy so many of these things. So we're talking about what writers call the mass trance of consumerism. We're caught in it. But that doesn't mean to say we can't awaken from it. It comes back to each individual. And we can do that if we, if we want to. So the Environmental slogans are reduce, in other words, reduce the amount you've got, repair, and recycle. So uh, three R's, reduce, repair, recycle. So moving on now to the Noble Eightfold Path, what possible um, advice could we get from that? So the first one is right view, and as opposed to wrong view. So wrong view is, well, Whatever I do, good or bad actions, there's no result. Nothing, you know, it doesn't matter whether I do good or bad things because, you know, I'm just here and then I'm going to be dead anyway, so what does it matter? But in terms of the Buddhist teaching, right view is very clearly wholesome deeds, unwholesome deeds have results, have good and bad results. So we need, if we understand this working of karma, uh, we need to take responsibility for our actions. Moving on now to right intention. Right intention is, there are three sides to the right intention. Non-greed, non-ill will, non-cruelty. And each of these is, is absolutely vital in terms of, of, the, of what we've been talking about. But if we look at the non-greed aspect, this could be, um, this could be termed dispassion or, or even renunciation. And I think renunciation is a supremely important concept in a society driven by this endless need to consume. Remember that we're being, it's not just that we want to consume, we're being told to consume. Constant advertising, being made to feel that we aren't complete or happy unless we get these things. So the opposite of that is renouncing, giving things up if you don't actually really need them. So Ajahn Sujita, one of our teachers, has described renunciation as uh, the difference between needs and wants. 
So one can ask yourself, oneself, do I really need this thing, or is it something that I can do without? And if we are living with other people, as we do in the monastery, then there is a lot of pleasure to be gained in renouncing something, giving up something that I have for somebody else, so they can use it or enjoy it. Or we share many, many things in the monastery, just tools, implements, umbrellas, many, many things. We have a small amount of personal possessions, but sharing is the norm here. And obviously that has its problems, it's not perfect. We have to repair things and things aren't always put away where they should be put away and so on. But a lot of joy can arise from renunciation and sharing. And yet the message in the society is just keep acquiring, keep accumulating. That is what is going to make you happy. So is, is happiness to be found in accumulation of consumer goods? Or are there other ways to be happy? So I would like to suggest that by being with others and sharing with them, we can experience greater happiness than we do by just um, trooping through the shopping malls and uh, hypermarkets and buying things. The next uh, factor on the path is right speech. So, <laughs> uh, we live in a very noisy world, a noisy universe, lots of voices, lots of messages coming at us. And uh, we know that some of the messages, some of the information is, is distorted or is misinformation. And I think in particular to do with the issue of climate change, we've had a lot of misinformation because vested interests don't want us to make changes. They're getting too many profits from us. That's one aspect. And certain media moguls don't want us to understand about climate change. People feel threatened. Ordinary people feel fearful that they'll lose what they have they, or that they won't be able to be as free as they have been. They're going to lose privileges and rights. So all of these forces are working to create misinformation. So I think the first, one of the first things, duties we have, if we care about the issue, is to make sure that we're fully informed. It's our individual responsibility to, to, to inform ourselves. So that means you know, going to accurate sources of information and really being clear about what is going on. And in terms of how we communicate with others, if we are trying to work towards some amelioration of the, the whole crisis, then it's very important that we don't tell lies. We tell the truth and we tell it in a way that's compassionate and kind and takes into account the needs of other people. So vilifying people, abusing people, this isn't going to work. What we have to do is come from this heart of loving kindness, using the Brahma Viharas, understanding that everyone has their karma and their particular needs. But that doesn't mean to say we have to back off telling the truth. We can hold to our truth and speak that truth in a kind and compassionate way. And, and that is the way to really influence other people. And then finally we come to, to right action. So as I was saying, I think it's our duty to inform ourselves of what is accurate in terms of information, and then to come to some kind of, to contemplate, what, what should I do? What is the right thing to do in this situation? And then thirdly, to make a decision and then to act on it. And for each individual, it may be different what they choose or to do or not to do. But in terms of right action, what are things that we could do? For example, um, I've just been through the mantra, the, the three R's. Um, we, as we approach this COP26 meeting, the idea of sh sharing circles, but also another proposal I heard on the media. So the media is full of proposals at the moment. If you want to tune in and listen to these uh, ideas for how to help the situation. Another idea is about not idling your car. And this is something I've been aware of for many years. I've seen people sitting reading newspapers or sitting watching their phones and the car engine is running. And I really have, uh, it's always sort of struck me here, but this is something that we should all do. Anyone who owns a car or drives a car, don't idle the car. Use it to, to drive and to move places, but don't idle it. And two, two issues which are mentioned under possible right action. Uh, one would be to look at our travel and transport needs. 
um, because the, the greatest thing about modern humanity is our mobility. We move from here to there and back again and constantly on the move. So I think we each need to consider how necessary is, is this trip, particularly when it's by, by car or by plane, because these are uh, forms of transport that contribute massively to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Do I really need to undertake this trip? Uh, ask yourself this, could I go by on foot or by bike or perhaps by train? Or does this trip really need to happen? So that's something we need to ask ourselves. And the other issue, one other issue is to do with, with meat. We've been discussing some of the effects in agriculture, but um, the, the statistics around meat are quite shocking. So one, a piece of land that is sufficient to feed one meat eater, they estimate, is sufficient to feed 20 vegetarians. And uh, the rearing of meat and cattle uh, involves huge amounts of feed, water, land and fuel. So lots of resources go into that. Of course, the profit from that is quite, quite large because they can send it to these w w wealthy uh, countries where people will pay a lot for meat. The other uh, uh, statistic is that if we were to feed everyone on Earth, every human being on Earth with meat, then we would need a land area four times the size of the Earth. So these are the statistics around meat production and the effect on the environment. But there are other issues, for example, to do with cruelty. I think if many, if meat, meat eaters were to go and to see how animals were treated uh, in the industrial agricultural uh, situation, they would be profoundly shocked. Because uh, there is de-beaking, pulling off the beak, de-horning, um, forcible impregnation, castration, and animals are locked into crates uh, that they can hardly move around in, all for the sake of human beings' consumption later on. So a lot of cruelty uh, in terms of how animals are reared. And the final issue is one of health, because with the production of beef, there's a lot of hormones used for, in cattle and also antibiotics used in meat and dairy farming. And these things get into our bodies and could be causing um, a lower standard of health than we, than we already have. So for these three reasons, people might like to consider, I'm not saying they have to, but consider becoming vegetarian and um, you know, give up meat one day a week and you know, have meat the rest of the week. And then if it works, if it's not too painful, you can extend to two days or three days or four days a week. So it's just a suggestion of the kind of right action we could get into. So it's coming towards the end of time. I'll just finish off by saying that, you know, when human beings, I've talked a lot about unskillful and unwholesome human activity, but I have a profound belief that human beings are also capable of great goodness and great self-sacrifice and heroism. I know the goodness. I live in a monastery where I've been supported. I've been living as a monk for almost 30 years. And people's goodness has sustained this life that I'm leading. And there are many instances where humans coming together and having been fully informed about something are prepared to act. And I'll talk about very briefly about some of them. So one is like action on smoking. When I was a child, uh, people could smoke in restaurants, they could smoke in cinemas and in railway carriages. And all that has come to an end. Okay, we haven't abolished smoking, but an attempt has been made. What about um, the ozone layer, the, the hole in the ozone layer? About 20 years ago, that became to, seen as a major problem, but people really worked hard to get rid of these CFCs and to cure that problem. Uh, other issues, for example, famine relief. People, out of the goodness of their hearts, support live aid, comic relief, trying to um, help people in starving people in, in poor countries. Um, and then there's the nuclear weapons. Uh, people became very concerned about nuclear weapons in the 60s, and they, they took action, and then governments took action, and it resulted in the Test Ban Treaty. All of these issues are much smaller than climate change, but they're indicators of what human beings can do. Um, we have to do something as individuals because the politicians are frightened that the voters won't support them. 
So this is the power that you have. You have the power of being a consumer and a voter and somebody who can influence the people around them. That is not inconsiderable. The consumers in the rich countries have influenced the consumers in other countries. They strive to be like us. And if the consumers in the rich countries change their habits, then such other consumers might change theirs as well. So I'll finish on a couple of quotes. This is from Mother Teresa, who was working, as you know, with the poor in India. And this is what she said. They say my work is just a drop in the ocean. I say the ocean is made up of drops. They say my work is just a drop in the ocean. I say the ocean is made up of drops. And the last one is from the Buddha. Very important piece of communication. So he said, I am in contention with no one. I am a friend to all. I am in contention with no one. I am a friend to all. So on that, night, on that particular note, I'll, I'll stop the talk. Wishing everyone well. There are some questions and I'll do my best to, to answer these questions. <clears throat> so number one, these questions have come through the internet. Do you have any suggestions on working with feelings of powerlessness and not being overcome by them? So I think I've tried to answer that one, that we do have power. People who live in rich countries, we're consumers. And uh, both the supermarkets and the people who produce the goods do take account of our behavior. So if one was, for example, to decide, I don't want to buy things in plastic packaging, and you went to the manager of the supermarket and you said, please, I want to buy goods that don't have plastic packaging. He might begin to listen to you, especially if other people were going up and saying the same things. And even more so if you weren't buying the goods in the plastic packaging. That kind of power really does have effect and it could knock on down the line. You have a power as a voter. That if, if there are politicians who genuinely want to help with the situation, you can vote for them and you can at least write to the newspapers or political websites or whatever. And finally, you have the power to influence your friends and people around you, acquaintances. That is not inconsiderable. It's only through setting an example that we can actually begin to make change. Because the problem is, if you just tell people off uh, or nag them or whatever, or set a, a poor example, they won't follow you or they won't listen to you. But if you set a good example, then they will. Question number two, for someone new to Buddhism, can you, <laughs> can you explain the Eightfold Path and how this might relate regarding climate change? So I've tried my best. Uh, in, I've taken a few of the factors of the path. I haven't talked about um, right livelihood. I could just mention that one because the Buddha uh, in his day referred to five particular trades uh, under right livelihood, which he recommended people not to, to get into. And four of them concerned preserving or helping life. So the recommendation was not to get into these trades, poisons, weapons, living beings, and meat. And the fifth one was intoxicants. But we, we see, if we take that list seriously, how carefully he had thought through what he meant by non-harming and non-killing. The other aspects of the path, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration, I think I have talked about in terms of how we cultivate, because the cultivation in here to, in, to achieve some kind of internal balance is very, very important. And you know, if people are engaged in campaigning and all this kind of thing, they can get very uh, angry and very disillusioned and so forth. But if you come back in here, and watch these emotions and watch these states of mind. This is a way of calming the mind, letting go of these very negative uh, emotions, and in, in a sense, renewing and, and um, refreshing the heart. Very, very important. So 
I don't think I'll say anything more about the Noble Eightfold Path. I've said quite a bit about it. Question three. Are there any examples of the Buddha trying to effect changes on any ecological, ecological issues or political situations of his time? So, um, there are two that I can remember uh, or that I've read about. So one is when he intervenes uh, in a potential war, there were two ethnic groups, the Kolians and uh, his own group, the Sakians, and they were about to have a war over a water resource. This could be a very modern issue. We may well be having wars about water resources soon. So these two tribes or ethnic groups were about to have a war, and the Buddha hears about this. He appears on the site of the battle field before they can fight. And they're all very ashamed because they know it's co totally contrary to his teachings. And then he puts this to them. He says, which is, uh, which is more valuable, the waters of the river or human blood? And they say, human blood, uh, Lord. They put down their weapons uh, and he, he manages to bring a peace. They come to some kind of sensible arrangement about the river water. And the other time was, he's nearing his, he's very old and so forth, he, and some deput deputation arrives from the king of Magadha, Aj Ajatasattu. And it's their job to find out if the Buddha thinks it might be a good time for King Ajatasattu to attack the Vajians. This is a kind of confederacy of, uh, of people called the Vajians, an old fashioned republic. And so the Buddha is very skillful. He doesn't say yes or no or whatever. He says, well, are the Vajians uh, keeping up their practices of meeting frequently, meeting in concord, not changing well-established principles, honoring their elders, honoring ascetics and so forth? And his attendant says, yes, Lord, they are, yes. Then he says, it, they can be expected to prosper and not to decline. So the deputation of the king listens to that. They go back and say, oh, it's not a good time to attack. But those are the only two times he really didn't get involved in politics. He could have been a king or a, or a raja or a chief, but he chose not to. He was talking to everybody. Remember, he was saying, I am in contention with no one. I am a friend to all. And he was really trying to do that to every level of society. <clears throat> then it says, how might Amravati and or those present here be able to influence wider society regarding climate change. Okay, well, we do try very hard here to not to waste things, to be frugal, to recycle wherever we can, uh, to share things, um, to hold resources in common, and not to waste things. Uh, sometimes we have arguments and debates about the best way to do this. Um, in the, in the wider sense, Amravati is changing in that we have a, a long-term plan to build a kind of echo village here. We've already done a few buildings on, along this line so that they're well insulated, they'll be in the minimum use of power, electricity to keep them heated and so forth. So we are gradually changing over to these ecologically much more uh, helpful buildings. So that's the long term of Amirati, and we're getting support for this. So this is a very good uh, development. So I, I would say that we aren't, you know, we, we're not perfect. We're not um, the ultimate model for, for how people um, uh, can combat climate change, but we do offer some aspects. And I was stressing them earlier in the talk, we, we share. We're not just holding onto things for ourselves, except for a few, few small possessions. So this is the kind of thing that people can do, get into circles, get into groups where they cooperate. And through that cooperation and coming together and sharing things, a new kind of culture can emerge. That's all I can suggest. And also if people want to come, once the COVID emergency is over, if people want to come to the monastery to get moral or spiritual sustenance, then they're very, very welcome to do that and spend time in a bit of peace and quiet. 
So number four, it says, are you aware of the activities and disruption created by Extinction Rebellion? There are those who are very much against civil disobedience regarding social justice issues such as restitution for a country's colonial past, Black Lives Matter, LGBT plus rights, etc., etc. Uh, are there any examples of campaigning and civil disobedience in the Buddhist time? And what might be his view on this today? And what might be your guidance? So I'll try and keep this short. So in the Buddha's day, the society there was primarily agrarian. It was in rural areas. Whereas this kind of civil disobedience and campaigning, I would associate mainly with towns and urban areas. Um, people were worried about law and order. They were worried about bandits and dacoits, and they expected that the king would somehow keep them safe. So law and order was an issue, and they might well petition the king about that. But otherwise, they wanted to be allowed to get on with their lives. But the other aspect perhaps we should take account of is that they saw um, a very different dimension in terms of, uh, of realms of existence. So nowadays, we're just stuck with one realm, the human realm. We don't seem to know that there are any other realms. But for people living in the Buddhist time, there was a multiple system of realms, a cosmology, including spirits, tree spirits, devas, maras, brahmas, all these kinds of uh, spiritual beings that they thought or felt were real. And so they would look to these as much as uh, to the political um, rulers of the day. They would seek to propitiate spirits or uh, do the right thing uh, to get the favours of these invisible beings. This was as much important to them as, as the civil society. So such a different world. Uh, so they didn't think in the same way that we do. Um, I am aware of some of the disruptive activities of Extinction Rebellion, but I'd just like to go back to the point I made earlier that if we get, get into violence, and that could, disruption could lead to violence, uh, if we get into abuse and vilifying people, then we may end up um, alien, alienating those who are, who are watching. And the whole point is that we surely, if we set a kind of good example, then there's a chance of taking other people with us. Unless this becomes disseminated through the society in general, I don't think we're going to make much of an impact. So I think violence is counterproductive in the end. Um, you may get a short-term uh, benefit, but long-term I don't think it'll work. Number five, if there could be one outcome to advocate in the upcoming 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the parties, COP26 in Glasgow, what would that be? Well, I'm now you're asking me questions beyond my competence. I think really you have to go to climate change experts for, for that. I would just say maybe if the nations of the world could somehow um, manage to limit the um, you know, percentage rise of temperatures, that would be a fantastic achievement. But it's a, you know, it's, it's a big prospect. If you're a politician and you're frightened of what the voters, how they will react. Um, but, you know, that would be a wonderful achievement. I'll go to another question. Were there the equivalent of climate change deniers in the Buddhist time? How would he have uh, interacted or responded to them? And how might this guide us today? Well, I don't think there were. <laughs> but there might have been people who denied Dhamma, who poured scorn on the teachings of the Buddha or wouldn't show him respect. Um, that would perhaps be the nearest equivalent that I can think of. And the Buddha was always very polite. He was, you know, he, he, he never vilified or scolded people because they, they didn't believe him. He said, take this teaching, examine it for yourself, see if there's any truth in it. And if, you know, if people didn't want to listen, then that was okay. He was available if people wanted to listen. But he wasn't out to force his views down their throats. And he never told his monks to go out and proselytize. He said, walk the highways for the benefit or the welfare of the many folk. But meaning that if they come to you and they want to talk to you about the Dhamma, then you can explain the Dhamma to them. So I think he would have been fairly cool around climate change deniers. They're human beings. Um, tried to have had uh, some loving kindness for them, but 
The Buddha would never refrain from telling the truth if it was going to help people. Question eight, climate change will disproportionately affect the less rich countries more and there needs to be political and economic change to address this. Did the Buddha comment on political models of his time and would he have a view on democracy versus autocracy, etc.? And did he comment on the concept of money and economic models? Um, no, I, I, as far as I'm aware, he didn't talk about economic models, but he did talk about duties and responsibilities. So he talked about the role of the husband and the wife and the children, the employer, the employee. He said, if you fulfill your duties properly to, you know, to the people who depend on you, then you can lead a happy and, and, uh, life and you can be free of worry. In terms of sharing, yes, I would agree with you that the, the rich countries need to share with the, with the, with the poorer countries. Uh, otherwise, things will only get even even more worse. I think this is what they call climate justice, isn't it? But whether we'll get there, I don't know. I think the whole point about this is it has to begin with individuals rather than governments. Governments will follow along behind uh, what the what the ordinary people are saying. Um, we have to make efforts in our own little area and and try and influence governments that way. It's another question, how might the Buddha's separate teachings to the monastics and to the lay people differ on a monastics and on a lay person's response to climate change? So all I can say is that for, you know, for, for monks and nuns, there is a clear training vehicle. We, we have something called Vinaya that guides our, our actions and how, how we relate to each other and how we relate to the world. Uh, but people in lay life don't have the same level of vinya. They have precepts. So that we hope or uh, trust that they will try to keep to those precepts. Um, but they have uh, families to support and they have a job to fulfill and a role in the world that monks and nuns don't, don't have. Uh, so in terms of livelihood and holidays and so on, uh, we would ask simply ask that the a lay person perhaps tries to consider the needs of the planet. So a very key uh, phrase, it seems to me, is not what can I afford, but what can the earth afford? Not what can I afford, but what can the earth afford? And then also the issue of harmlessness. Uh, in the lay life, it's perhaps easy to harm creatures, unless you're very uh, careful. If, if anyone comes to the monastery and they walk around, they will notice that both the squirrels and the birds hardly bother to run away from human beings. There is a completely different atmosphere inside the monastery. Pigeons will be walking here and they won't flutter away, or not until the very last minute, because they know they can trust the people here. But you have to come to the monastery to verify this for yourself. But there is a huge difference sometimes in the atmosphere inside a monastery where people are trusted and outside. Question nine. The topic of climate change is immense. One can feel powerless and get very despondent. There has also been a huge increase in mental health issues, such increases in anxiety and depression, including with the young during the pandemic, and there will be worldwide grief and complex trauma stroke CPTSD to contend with. So I suppose that's coronavirus PTSD, I'm not sure. Well, first of all, grief isn't new. To be honest, in human society, human life, we've always had to go through periods of grief. But what I feel from the question here is an immense amount of worry. It continues, any advice to lay people on how to deal with these concerns and if one is so worried about how to make a living in the predicted global economic downturn, how can one person respond to climate change issues to when one is worried out a roof and food for oneself and one's family? So a little bit jumbled in terms of words, but the main thing is this worry, this pressure and this tension, mental stress coming through. So I'd just like to mention about mental stress and worry that um, we need to take time out. We need to calm the mind 
and have a quiet space and get a perspective on some of these, these mental states. Otherwise, we just get driven by them. And if we listen all the time to the media and hear endless tales of suffering and uh, worrying stories and anxiety-provoking stories, then, of course, we, we just add all the time to the anxiety. We need to take time out and chill out let go of these things, know, understand what they really are, or this is worry, this is panic, this is pressure, this is whatever else this is, and relate to them in, in, the, in a skillful way, let go of them. And it's not just sitting in meditation, it may also help if you're feeling very pressurized and, and worried to get out into nature, spend a day out in nature, um, listen to nature. So we're not just talking about protecting nature, but benefiting from her as well. Get out into nature and you'll hear a different kind of voice. And then this may help to, to overcome the worry and the anxiety. One mental health is very important. And I just think sometimes uh, the, the uh, information coming from the media is like a whole series of gadflies. Gadflies bite the body, but these are mental gadflies that cause people to, to suffer enormously. And so we have to be aware of those mental states. So I think probably that is almost it. I'll come to a final question, which I backed off earlier. So it's question six. There is a tension between preserving human life and animal life. For example, very strong polarized opinions were voiced in the news and on social media over the person saving hundreds of pet cats and dogs by bringing them from Afghanistan to the UK, with some left behind in Afghanistan, seeing the UK as placing more value on a pet than, say, an Afri Afghan child. What are your views on this and how this might relate to dealing with climate change? So I say, first of all, um, I've not, not heard about this. Um, it is a particular issue at a particular time, a very sad or tragic event. And unfortunately, human history is littered with these things. But what this talk is uh, intending to address is the issue of climate change and the health of the biosphere. So by preserving the biosphere, by preserving other species, as well as human beings, we um, support the web of life. Um, we have to look at all of life. Yes, pets are important, but so are wildlife creatures. And obviously this was a very tragic moment, the departure from Af Afghanistan. But there have been plenty of such incidents, and there will be more, unfortunately, uh, with, with human behaviours and human willingness to fight each other and uh, not be able to understand each other. So I'd better leave it there. So I'd like to thank you very much for, for listening. I'll just ask now if there's anyone else in the room who might want to ask a question or raise an issue. You're very welcome to. Okay, there's no one. So I'd just like to wish everyone the very best for the future. Keep practicing, stay calm, and do whatever you can. Goodbye for now.